The Catholic Church has officially published guidelines and procedures for diagnosing demonic possession and performing an exorcism. But this is just one piece of a much larger picture. For centuries, there has existed a mysterious, esoteric side of the Christian faith. It does not prescribe to any denominations of Christianity. Instead, it demands that the individual surrender all ideas about what God is or what the universe could be. These preconceived notions are said to be just false idols. The truth is more profound and exponentially more intense. This is the practice of Christian mysticism. This approach to the religion has allegedly served as the gateway to phenomena both divine and satanic. The wounds of stigmata, divine visions and prophecy, levitation, and divine ecstasy have all been reported by these followers. Later in this essay, I will discuss this practice and these phenomena in great detail. For now, I should start with what was promised. How to perform an exorcism. Before we get truly started, there is something I should say. I myself am not Christian, and this essay will not evangelize about the Christian faith. However, my personal beliefs are not really relevant to the conversation at hand, so I will treat Christian mystical traditions and phenomena with a level of reverence. This is partially in an effort to be respectful. It is also to avoid fatiguing the viewer with the constant inclusion of personal disclaiming language. Diabolical intervention can be described as any intrusion on human life by a demon or the devil. A demon being a fallen angel who has been cast out of heaven for helping Satan rebel against God. But a mystical reading of the Bible does result in some qualifications for the diabolical. The first and most important principle is that demons do exist and can meaningfully interface with human beings in ways both physical and spiritual. The mystics accept this as fact. However, the mystics say that human will can only be moved in two ways, by God or by man's free will. So the most that demons can do is persuade. They cannot entirely take over a person's free will, but they can influence very strongly. To aid in this, demons can perform seemingly miraculous feats. These feats will arouse a man's admiration and interest to the extent that the individual will feel compelled to follow the demon. However, it should be stated that these feats are not true miracles. Although seemingly miraculous, only God can perform a true miracle, as defined by the mystics. There are a lot of other things demons simply cannot do. A demon cannot, as stated, produce any truly divine phenomena. A demon also cannot create any substance. The power of creation belongs to God alone. A demon cannot raise the dead, though he may be able to produce the illusion of having done so. Only God can heal, so a demon can never truly cure wounds, fractures, or injuries. Demons cannot make true prophecies because the devil does not know what God may bring about. Nor does a demon have access to a human's intellect or will, so he can't truly know a person's secret. Demons are said to be remarkably intelligent, though, so they could predict people's behaviors quite astutely. So, limitations aside, what can a demon do? A demon can produce visions, both corporeal and imaginative. A demon could falsify the state of religious ecstasy in an individual, or even produce the light and heat that many mystics have claimed to experience through God. A demon could cause an illness and then cure it, virtually mimicking the power of healing. This includes producing the stigmata, which is something we will talk about later in this video. However, even more dangerous than these tricks and more relevant to the subject of exorcism, the mystics believe in demonic obsession and possession. Most versions of Christianity believe in the temptation of the devil, that demons or Satan can tempt humans into sin. But the mystics, specifically, believe in two more severe alternatives, demonic obsession and demonic possession. Mystic texts do not reveal a hard line between temptation and obsession, but in general, authentic obsession sees clear satanic activity on, but separate from, the individual. 
the soul is aware of an external force trying to exert violence upon it, but the soul also maintains its own agency. Obsession can be internal or external. Internal obsession affects a person's interior faculties, most specifically the imagination. This can manifest as a fixed idea within the intellect or by vivid images and sounds within the mind. Internal obsession may impart on a person a set of duties or goals that they otherwise would find repugnant. The mystics say that the best antidote for interior obsession is prayer, self-disdain, confidence in God, and the use of sacraments in the church. External obsession presents more spectacularly, but in reality is less dangerous. In cases of external obsession, an individual sees devilish apparitions in a very real physical sense. These visions can be pleasant should the devil transform himself into an angel to deceive the individual's soul, but some visions may be more straightforward. Satan may appear in horrifying forms to terrify the servants of God away from their practice. A person may hear screams and shouts of blasphemy, or songs designed to arouse sensuality. In external possession, a person may perceive either pleasant odors or an unbearable stench wherever they go. The sense of taste can also be affected. The devil often mixes objects or insects into a person's food, or causes meals to taste spoiled and bitter. Lastly, there is the sense of touch. An individual can feel things caused by the devil. These may be bruises, cuts, or blows. They could also be pleasant, sensuous caresses, or warm embraces. Both types of obsession are due to one of three causes. The first is God giving permission to the devil to affect a soul in order to test that individual's faith. The second is the pride of the devil. The mystics believe that sometimes the devil cannot bear the sight of a soul trying to glorify God, and so he attacks. Thirdly, an obsession may be due to an individual themselves, specifically the natural predisposition of the weak. Someone who is inclined to melancholy, sadness, or anxiety is believed to be more susceptible to demonic obsession. More dangerous than mere obsession, though, is possession. Where obsession is a series of external attacks on a person, possession is the full taking over of a victim's body by satanic forces. Mystics recognize that so-called possessions may often be caused by mental health crises and that true possessions are extraordinarily rare. But within mystical practice, there is no debate about the existence of diabolical possession. Various cases are described in the Gospels, and the Gospels are the ultimate truth. Furthermore, within the church itself, there have been numerous cases of this possession. Indeed, the church has instituted official exorcism rituals, which we will discuss momentarily. In a possession, the devil invades the body of a living person and moves his faculties and organs as if they were his own. The devil truly resides within the victim, physically, but not spiritually. Consider a man driving a car. Through physical means, the man can steer, brake, and accelerate, but the man is still, of course, a separate entity from the car itself. Such is demonic possession. Only God has the power to penetrate truly into a person's soul, so the soul of a possessed individual remains free. The primary purpose of a possession is to disturb the soul and draw it to sin in a rebellion against God. Within diabolical possession, there are two periods, the period of crisis and the period of calm. During periods of crisis, the devil usually openly reveals himself by acts, words, convulsions, seizures, obscenities, or blasphemy. During this time, victims lose consciousness, and when they regain their wherewithal, they have no recollection of what they have said or done. However, this is not always the case. Sometimes individuals are completely cognizant throughout periods of crisis. The saintly father Surin was himself allegedly possessed for 12 years in the 17th century. During this time, Father Surin wrote a letter in which he describes the symptomology and feeling of his possession. He is there as another I, and then it seems that I have two souls, one of which watches what the other one does. The two spirits struggle on the same field of battle, which is the body. I am at the same time filled with happiness and 
overwhelmed with a sorrow which is expressed in complaints and groans according to the caprice of the devils. I feel in myself the state of condemnation, and I fear it. I realize that the cries that come forth from my mouth proceed equally from these two souls, and it is impossible for me to say whether it is happiness or fury that causes them. During my seizures, my consolation is prayer, and I have recourse to it while my body rolls around on the floor, and the ministers of the church speak to me as to a devil and pronounce curses over me. My state is such that there remain very few actions in which I am free. If I wish to speak, my tongue rebels. During the mass, I find myself constrained to stop suddenly. At table, I cannot bring the food to my mouth. If I go to confession, I forget my sins, and I know that the devil is within me as in his house, coming and going as it pleases him. If I wake up, there he is waiting for me. If I pray, he distracts my thoughts as he wishes. When my heart is open to God, he fills it with fury. If I wish to keep a vigil, I sleep, and he takes glory in the fact that he is my master, which I actually cannot deny. During periods of calm, however, there is nothing to indicate the presence of the devil. A person may even think the devil has gone entirely. However, the devil's presence often manifests in periods of calm as some strange chronic illness. This illness resists any sort of diagnosis and does not match any known pathology, nor is it affected by any therapeutics. Diabolical possession is not always continuous. The devil may essentially come and go as he pleases into a person's body. He is not bound by anything other than his own selfish desires, so there is no obligation to continually possess a victim. The mystics recognize that there are countless nervous disorders which present symptoms virtually identical to possession. Further, they recognize that unbalanced souls have the ability to simulate possession. But the church has issued a series of rules for discerning fraud and identifying true possessions. The first of these is to simply recognize that possession is very rare. So perhaps it is best to err on the side of extreme caution. Agitation, the utterance of blasphemies, or even horror at the holy images are not alone sufficient proof for possession. These things could clearly proceed from a number of natural causes. The following are signs that allow for a certain diagnosis of demonic possession. To speak in an unknown language and to understand another who speaks in an unknown language. To perceive hidden objects and the manifestation of superhuman powers. When an individual speaks or understands unknown languages, a person must be careful in evaluating this symptom. There have been numerous psychological occurrences of people speaking in languages they had once spoken but forgot or heard. So for this symptom to be decisive proof, it is necessary to verify an absolute lack of contact with the given language. The revelation of hidden or distant objects is essentially a form of telepathy. This could be seeing things from miles away or a simple matter of identifying concealed objects repeatedly without fail. The manifestation of powers can include a number of things. Seemingly superhuman strength, the ability to fly or levitate, the ability to walk on the ceiling with the head fully rotated towards the ground. These are just a few. If any of these are present alongside other indicators for diabolical possession, a person is most likely authentically possessed. The church says there are a number of causes for possession, including punishment for sin, a test of faith, or even at the request of the victim. No matter the cause, though, there are a number of remedies. The Roman Ritual is one of the official liturgical books of the Catholic Church. It contains all of the services that a priest or deacon may perform. Within these pages, we can find several official remedies for demonic possession. The first and simplest is the taking of Holy Communion. During periods of calm, the communion may have a special efficacy for liberating victims from possession. Objects blessed by the prayers of the church also have a special power against the devil. Holy water, crucifixes, those sort of things can help expel the devil from a person. It is said in the Roman ritual that the devil will often flee at the mere sight of these. 
A person may also touch authentic relics of the saints to a possessed individual's skin. This could basically burn the demon away. By invoking the name of Jesus, you may also be able to force the devil to flee. God himself promised this power in the gospel. Likewise, the name of the Holy Mary is terrifying to the devil. Throughout history, saints have used their power over the devil by invoking these holy names and making the sign of the cross. But when none of these things work, the church has another official means. The use of exorcism. The Catholic Church has provided a couple of documents that detail how to perform an exorcism. One method is found in the Roman ritual. It describes the rules and the processes of an exorcism. The Roman ritual has basically 21 qualifications for conducting an exorcism. These steps may be followed with some amount of discretion on the part of the exorcist. But there is also a book called Of Exorcisms and Certain Supplications. This 84-page book, which is an official document published by the Catholic Church itself, contains the current ritual of demonic exorcism. It was revised in 1614 and then again in 1999. A slightly updated version was published in 2004. Until 2016, this document was only available in Latin. There now exists a church-endorsed English translation. Either of these books may be used in an exorcism, and they basically detail the same things. But the latter is more in-depth, so I will be leaning on that book as I describe the process of an exorcism. It is important to mention, though, that the church does not permit that exorcisms be conducted publicly. The power of exorcism requires massive amounts of knowledge, virtue, and personal discretion. So it is limited only to priests who have been designated by bishops. A bishop issues the power of exorcism to a candidate by first handing that candidate the book of exorcisms from the Roman ritual. As he does this, the bishop speaks a Latin phrase, and from this moment the priest has the power to cast out devils. He now has the title of priest exorcist, or simply exorcist. For the exorcist, step one is to verify the authenticity of the possession. An exorcist should not too easily believe that an individual is truly possessed. A person may be ill, psychologically or physically. It is also possible that a person is simply mistaken. Sometimes people falsely but authentically believe the temptations of the devil to be possession. It should also be said that in the case of real possession, the devil can use his tricks to make someone believe exorcism is not necessary. So, an exorcist must be vigilant in their investigations. Once a possession has been verified as authentic, the exorcist may begin preparing for the ritual. This starts with a period of prayer and fasting by all parties involved in the exorcism, if possible. Of exorcisms and certain supplications does not specify how long this period should be. If possible, the victim should pray and practice mortification of the flesh in preparation for the exorcism. The term mortification here simply means denying oneself physical pleasure. In the tamest, mortification has been used to describe fasting, voluntary poverty, or sexual abstinence. In more extreme interpretations, it can include self-flagellation with a whip or a spugna, which is a piece of cork that contains studs, metal spikes, or needles. The exorcism must, if possible, happen in a holy place, a church or a chapel, for example. In media and contemporary sources, people often depict the victim as being restrained by belts or ropes to avoid violent, demonical self-harm. Of exorcisms and certain supplications seems to indicate this is wholly incorrect. The book says that during the exorcism, if the individual is violently troubled, the exorcist must let the victim bear it completely. To do otherwise would be to distrust God. An exorcism must not be performed as a spectacle. Specifically, the church says it must be performed in such a way that no one can consider it as a magical or superstitious activity. There may be no media or social communication before, during, or after. No participating individuals are permitted to divulge information about the specific exorcism that has taken place. Loved ones or relevant individuals may be present at the ritual, but this is entirely at the discretion of the exorcist. 
Immediately prior to the exorcism, the priest must in private recite the following prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, word of God the Father and God of all creation, who gave authority to your holy apostles to subject demons in your name, and to tread underfoot all the power of the enemy, holy God, who among your other wonders deigned to command, put demons to flight, mighty God, by whose power Satan cast down, fell like lightning from heaven. I humbly invoke your holy name with fear and trembling that strengthened by your power I may attack with confidence the evil spirit who torments this your creature. For you will come to judge the living and the dead and the world by fire. Amen. With all of that, the priest and the victim are ready to begin the exorcism. The priest must arrive to the venue of the exorcism in one of two garments, either an alb or a surplice. The priest must also be wearing a violet stole. Once dressed and arrived, the exorcist must stand with the victim and speak a prayer to all of those present. This prayer is a sort of call and response which requires the participation of the entire group. The exorcist will then sprinkle holy water over the victim and the other attendees. This water may be blessed before or after being used here. The exorcist will then kneel and invite all attendees to pray and recite something called the Litany of Supplication. If desired, he may then recite a series of psalms and then several more prayers which are provided in of exorcisms and certain supplications. The exorcising priest will then display the holy cross to the victim, saying, Behold the cross of the Lord, be gone all hostile powers. After this, the priest will breathe onto the face of the victim and recite the following, By the breath of your mouth, O Lord, drive out all evil spirits, command them to be gone, for your kingdom is at hand. The exorcist then recites two of what the Catholic Church calls formulas over the victim. The first is the deprecative formula. This formula speaks directly to God, begging for mercy and asking the Lord to protect the victim from evil. The second formula, the imperative formula, speaks directly to the devil and implores him to depart from the victim. There are then a series of other formulas that the exorcist may choose to recite if he or she feels they are necessary. These may be applied, repeated, or ignored as many times as it takes to expel the demon. According to the Roman ritual, an exorcism may take one to four hours or longer. Finally, the exorcism is concluded with a giving of thanks to the Lord. So, there we have it. But as I've mentioned, the belief in demonic possession and exorcism is a tiny part of something bigger, of a more intense side of the Christian faith. That is, Christian mysticism. But mysticism is more than this supernatural sort of conversation. It is a tradition rife with the supernatural and sometimes the extreme, but at its core, it can be a beautiful way to address the idea of God. Christian mysticism is again not a denomination of Christianity, but rather it is a tradition of theology and practices that seek to redefine the human relationship with God. To be very reductive, mystics seek to unify their souls with the divine. Throughout history and into modernity, Christian mystics have embraced a wide variety of definitions, teachings, and practices, not all of which completely agree with one another. The quickest door into understanding Christian mysticism is simply etymology. Mysticism comes from the Greek word muéo, which means to close. This has been interpreted as keeping one's eyes closed, but also as keeping one's mouth closed. Other sources indicate the word has meant an initiation into mysteries. If we take all of these definitions into one approximation, mysticism then represents a hiddenness, a secret, and the learning of that secret. In any case, the word mysticism is fairly recent, but the word mystical, as in hidden, has been used among Christians since the late 2nd century BC. At this time and since, the word has been used to describe hidden meanings of the Bible, true meanings beyond what is most explicitly described by the text itself. These mystical elements have been investigated via beliefs, rituals, and practices that have likewise often been secretive in nature. Early Christians also used the term 
mystical theology. This is essentially a type of knowledge or understanding of God that cannot be reached by human rationality. Instead, this knowledge can only be accessed by the soul directly receiving a divine gift from God. So, clearly, language brings us only to a murky and vague place in our understanding of Christian mysticism. Such is mysticism. Many mystic priests and theologians have categorized God as being above the simplicity of human language. This is perhaps the core problem in writing about mysticism. The mystic definition of God cannot be given in words. God is to the mystics unspeakable. He is everything in ways that language cannot fully capture. Rather than a man in the sky, he is the sky. He is the land, he is the ground, and he is everything in between. God is the source of all things, he is all things, and he is the future of all things. Christian mysticism seeks to redefine the human relationship with God. The practice looks to forge a truly immediate and direct relationship with God. It is experiential, it is more than just prayer to God, but rather a spiritual unity with the divine that is fundamentally transformative. Mystic unity with God changes the practitioner's sheer existence on earth and their fundamental approach to all that life could ever entail. Mystics use written and spoken words, meditation, prayer, and ritual, which we will discuss, but these processes are not themselves union with God. These mediate a relationship with God. They are tools to perhaps find unity, but the true unity of God and human soul happens on a layer that is more intense and more profound than typical religious activities. The unity with God then may manifest itself through unexplainable phenomena, divine visions, prophecy, the stigmata, that are considered gifts from God himself. Again, we will talk more about these later in the video. Clearly, Christian mysticism is full of paradoxes and, indeed, mysteries. Perhaps it is tempting to jump immediately to the most spectacular phenomena that Christian mysticism has to offer, but to understand these most incredible elements, we should look at the foundations of this theology. Christianity and Judaism have a long and not always kind history with one another. But being that Christianity emerged from Judaism, we cannot really understand Christian mysticism without discussing Jewish mysticism. To find the earliest pieces of Jewish mysticism, we must go to the Hebrew scriptures, or what many people today call the Old Testament. In the pages of this book, it is quite easy to find early forms of Jewish mystical practice. Consider this verse from 1 Samuel, which is spoken over Saul by the prophet Samuel. Then the Spirit of the Lord will possess you, and you will be in a prophetic frenzy along with them and be turned into a different person. Here, the divine union that Christian mystics seek is mentioned specifically. The Spirit of the Lord will possess Saul and cause a prophetic frenzy, which is basically just religious ecstasy, a common phenomenon reported by mystics. Saul will then be turned into a different person, indicating the transformative experience that mystics seek. Of course, this is not the only instance of mysticism in the Old Testament. We can also look at the burning bush. There is Elijah's discovery of God, which happens in a, quote, sound of sheer silence. Purging the external senses and asceticism are common mystical practice. There is also Isaiah's vision of God's majesty, or Ezekiel's even more dramatic vision of God being carried to heaven in a chariot of fire. These sorts of supernatural occurrences are all typical of the mystical approach, and they are peppered all throughout Jewish religious texts. The earliest Christians were quick to recognize this. The Egyptian mystic, Origen of Alexandria, believed the biblical writings of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and a passage called the Song of Songs, when taken together, provided a secret roadmap for mystical development. Proverbs emphasizes virtue and ethics, which Origen took as representing a sort of challenge, an indication to cast out anything that stood in the way of your love for God. Ecclesiastes, with its philosophical musings, provided the enlightenment that God would grant an individual when they surrendered all attachments. The Song of Songs is a deeply erotic love story, but Origen believed it was a hidden message about the intimacy of mystical union with God. 
This intimacy was more profound than anything that could happen in the bedroom, according to Origen. Of course, mysticism's roots are not only found in Jewish texts. There are plenty of passages in Christian scriptures that carry similarly mystical tones. The most obvious is the transfiguration. In this passage, Jesus shines with radiant light on top of a mountain. In Christian teachings, the transfiguration is a pivotal moment, and the setting on the mountain is presented as the point where human meets God. It is the meeting place for the temporal and the eternal, where Jesus is the connecting point, a bridge between heaven and earth. There's also the passage in which two disciples travel from Jerusalem on the first Easter. Jesus accompanies them, though the men do not recognize him. The two disciples later say their hearts were burning with warmth as they spoke to the man. Indeed, a feeling of burning and supernatural heat is a commonly reported mystical phenomenon. One of the most notable sources of mysticism in the Bible is in the following passage, in which Paul mysteriously alludes to a third heaven. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. Whether you're a Christian or not, it's easy to see the sense of mystery in this passage. Paul suggests that this experience was unspeakable and secretive, and that it opened a segment of knowledge unknowable to mortals. This passage has served as ongoing inspiration for Christian mystics throughout history. So, hints of unknowable mystical experiences appear all throughout Christian texts, even if they were first born from Judaism. Early Greek language, Jewish texts, and Christian teachings all together create the Christian mystic tradition. But it is a tradition that has changed and grown throughout history. By the Middle Ages, Christian mysticism was a well-practiced tradition. Mystics all across the Christian world were recording their encounters and rituals, intimately describing the union with God that they sought or had achieved. Francis of Azizi received the stigmata, a series of wounds to the hands and feet, echoing those of Jesus himself. Simeon the New Theologian was said to have intense experiences of fire and light, leading to a profound change of his consciousness. Some mystics began to advocate for hesychism, or long periods of sensory deprivation and uninterrupted prayer. But then the Reformation came. During the Reformation, there emerged a suspicion against the idea of personal relationships with God from both Protestants and Catholics. The Protestants advocated for obedience to the Bible, while Catholics saw the church as authority for the lay people. Certainly, this is an oversimplification of the divisions between Protestants and Catholics, but for the purposes of this essay, it will do. Western Christianity was turning away from the personal experience of God and instead seemed more interested in the worldly behavior of the individual. Moral servitude and obedience became hallmarks of a good Christian life. At the time, modern, modern-ish, science was also becoming popular. Christian mysticism defied these rational beliefs, and so was starting to be regarded as pure superstition. Between the rejection of personal experiences with God and the supernatural in any form, mysticism was quickly falling out of vogue. And yet, it persisted. Determining how mysticism survived this mainstream rejection is pretty simple. Imagine if you, sincerely, earnestly believed you had a supernatural experience. If you believed your soul was truly made one with God. This revelation would be fundamentally life-changing. It would alter the way you see every piece of reality. With that in mind, societal rejection may feel inconsequential or trite, and indeed Christian mystics continued their practice. After the Middle Ages, some of these mystics were labeled as heretics or were excommunicated entirely. Others became less outward in their mystic practice. Those like Therese of Lisieux simply incorporated mysticism into their regular religious practices. Especially within the confines of monastic life, mysticism likely seemed more appropriate to the world at large. Eastern Orthodox churches were largely unaffected by the Reformation or the advent of modern science, at least in this conversation, and so within them, mysticism continued to thrive. 
Russians produced a mystical text within the context of Eastern Orthodoxy, still questing to unlock the secrets within pages of the Bible. The Quakers were likewise a Christian movement that held on to mystical elements of the faith. Scholars have referred to theirs as a democratic mysticism, in which God's light shone within all people. The Quakers said that when groups of Christians prayed together, God could deliver gifts to any individual. Pentecostalism emerged in the 20th century, which certainly had foundational elements within Christian mysticism. Pentecostal worship is marked by ecstatic singing and dancing in an effort to seek communion with God. Believers are then, in the faith, gifted with a number of mystical abilities, including speaking in tongues. It is again something of a simplification, but also true to say that these threads kept Christian mysticism alive and well into relative modernity. As the cultural pendulum swung away from the wholesale rejection of the mystical, scholars and thinkers began to take these ideas more seriously. Notable theologians took interest in the mysteries of the scripture, and this interest trickled down to mainstream academic and spiritual Christianity. At this same time in the mid-20th century, there was a growing interest in Eastern spirituality. For Christians in the West, Christian mysticism seemed like a sensible alternative to Eastern practices they may have seen as sacrilegious. Scholars began translating the writings of early Christian mystics into English, including many works that had never left their respective native languages. Suddenly, a whole side of Christianity was revealed to the English-speaking world. The Vatican in the 1960s started encouraging the masses to embrace a new, fuller version of Christian spirituality. Of course, then the internet came about, and volumes of spiritual information and opportunities were distributed worldwide. Certainly, some of these were more legitimate than others, but the point remains. Christian mysticism was both endorsed like it hadn't been in years, and available like it hadn't been ever. Early Christian mystics were often hermits who lived alone in the forest or the desert. During the medieval era, mysticism entered into the monastic tradition, and most practitioners were monks or nuns. Recently, and today, mysticism can and does exist within both of these versions, but we also have an era of ordinary mysticism, wherein any person with access to literature and or the internet can discover the mysteries of the Bible for themselves. So we now have some idea of mysticism's core mission, the unity with God, and we have an understanding of its historical journey on a very basic level. But many questions still remain, the first of which is how? What does mysticism look like in practice? It's important to note that we cannot possibly cover every piece of mystical practice ever used. There are millennia's worth in existence. But what we can do is instead discuss some practices which have been ubiquitous in the mystic tradition. There are a number of these. Some of them will present as quite ordinary. Prayer, reading the Bible, etc. Others will undoubtedly seem more extreme. Intense isolation, the cleansing of senses, and even vows of eternal silence. So as not to paint an unnecessarily extreme picture of mysticism, though, we should start with the more, for lack of a better word, normal practices. Most foundationally, Christian mysticism is rooted in the reading of the Bible. But the mystic does not strive for an academic or even literary understanding of the text. The mystic also does not see the Bible as only a doctrine of moral regulation. Instead, they believe that the Bible is the divine word, and thus the mystics seek to penetrate beneath those words that appear on the page. In fact, mysticism in its early days was primarily just a way to describe the hidden layers of the Bible. Mystics study, analyze, interpret, and meditate to unlock secret meanings and profound insights they believe to be basically hidden in the text. In so doing, mystical reading of the Bible encourages direct contact with God. Prayer is just as important in Christian mysticism as it would be in many other forms of Christianity. Mystics see prayer as being an act in preparation for achieving a mystical consciousness, for the unity, for the higher existence that they truly seek. The general name given to mystical prayer is contemplative prayer. This term, contemplation, has meant a number of things to the mystics throughout history. 
generally it is used to refer to a sort of experiential knowledge of God. In this type of prayer, one does not ask God for favors, but instead seeks unity with God. Origen of Alexandria, who we discussed earlier, wrote extensively about prayer. These works for the mystics have been a permanent source of information on prayer, how to pray, and the role of prayer. For Origen, praying did not exist to influence the will of God. He did not seek favors or assistance from God in everyday trials. Rather, it opened the door to a higher level of consciousness. So in mystic prayer, an individual should clean their mind of any and all worldly things or remembrances. According to Origen, these would defile the mind and interrupt the connection with God. So the question then becomes, what should a person think of or say when praying? Origen's opinions on that are mysterious. Acknowledging the paradoxical nature of this belief, he says that prayer protocols will be gifted by God when you learn to clean your mind of worldly matters. The divine to Origen seems wholly unconcerned with material things. So only when you remove them from your mind are you then fit to look into the face of God himself and converse with him. Then in some way, likely both physical and spiritual, you will see the face of God. Origen goes on to discuss the importance of praying without ceasing, as mentioned in the Bible. The mystical life, he said, should be one long, uninterrupted prayer. A person should not only practice this version of prayer when praying, but at all times. Origen says what is usually termed prayer is only one part of the real version of prayer, and must be practiced no fewer than three times per day. So, mystic prayer, then, is both a method and a goal in its own right. Beyond liturgy and prayer, Christian mysticism offers more extreme, again for lack of a better word, ways to get in touch with God. These exercises are part of a larger, fuller life commitment to God himself. Many of them are rooted in early monasteries. Among the most important of these are solitude and silence. Sermon on the Mount is basically a section from the Bible of teachings and sayings allegedly given by Jesus himself. In these writings, Jesus says, But when you pray, go into a room by yourself, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. To the mystics, this is a clear indication of the importance of solitude. Indeed, this hermit lifestyle has been typical of mystics throughout history. Mystic teachings say that God is beyond all human knowing and speaking. He is thus encountered primarily in verbal and mental silence. Close your eyes, close your mouth, go away, and meet God. The Philokalia is a collection of texts written by Eastern Orthodox masters and mystics between the 4th and 15th centuries. In these texts, there is the Discourse on Abba Philemon. This discourse details the lives of desert monks who would serve as the basis for much of mystical practice. Most strikingly, it provides us with a detailed picture of perhaps the purest form of Christian mysticism. Abba Philemon was a monk who lived likely around 600 CE. Philemon lived in a cave in the desert. It is said that he lived in absolute poverty, braiding ropes from natural materials and trading those ropes for small rations of bread. Philemon ate only bread and salt. This was a sort of self-deprivation wherein he did not experience pleasures of the flesh. Instead, he plunged himself into the mysteries of the Bible. He never spoke to anyone, even in church on Sundays. When he attended church, Philemon stood in a corner, apparently weeping through the entire service. Philemon believed a person must purify the intellect completely through a mental stillness. He said then the mind would be so captured and obsessed by the mysteries of the Bible that it would be impossible to turn away from mystic practice. Philemon said it was important not to experience sensual pleasure. To him, passion for these things could be quieted by stillness. But in that state of stillness, should sensation strike, it would be savage and near impossible to, quote, cure, eventually leading to sin. So, Philemon said, one must struggle and live without sensation. He said a mystic must be cityless, homeless, possessionless, and free from all worldly pleasures. Only then, Philemon argued, would you become focused enough and indeed worthy to see God and form a union with the divine. Philemon and countless other mystics believed union with God was the door to supernatural phenomena. 
things that humans simply could not explain. And so to discuss Christian mysticism, we should also discuss these things. I'd like to emphasize that Christian mysticism is not solely about the phenomena we will discuss here. The mystic practice is a fundamental way of conceiving the Christian God and convening with the divine. Supernatural phenomena are part of the mystic tradition, but they should not be mistaken as being themselves the mystic tradition, or even the singular goal of mysticism. For this section of the video, I will lean on a book called The Theology of Christian Perfection. Originally published in the 1940s, this book is relatively contemporary, but it is essentially a compendium of older teachings. It has an extensive bibliography of these official church texts and theological works cited. Using these sources, the book goes into great detail about supernatural phenomena as they relate to the Christian mystical tradition. Before we get into specific phenomena, we should establish some core concepts. Most importantly, we must clarify the following ideas natural, supernatural, and preternatural. For the mystics, the word natural may be used in a few different senses. Natural causes are those properties which an entity can produce by its own powers or abilities, the effects an entity may have on another through these powers, or whatever properties an entity requires for development within its own natural order. Supernatural is used to describe any property or power that transcends the natural. These things transcend the abilities, properties, and laws of the natural world. It is above the natural, but not against it. God, according to the mystics, works within the natural, not in violence or in any way opposed to it. Within supernatural, there exist two further divisions, the simpliciter and the secundum quid. This division is easy to understand. The simpliciter surpasses the power of any creature that could ever exist. The secundum quid exceeds the powers of a particular creature, but not all creatures. However, the simpliciter is then divided into the quad substantium and the quad modum. Quad substantium refers to things that were created supernaturally, have always been in existence, and have no natural aspects to them at all. These would include things like the Holy Trinity, God himself, or God's grace. On the other hand, the quad modem includes things that are natural but have been created supernaturally. For example, a prophecy. A human speaking words is entirely natural, but a prophecy is produced by the divine and to a supernatural end. Therefore, it is in the quad modem. Lastly, there is the preternatural. This includes things that exceed the powers of humans but are well within the abilities of all creation. The most obvious example here would be the abilities of an angel or a demon. These surpass those of humans, but not of God, of the supernatural. These divisions matter because they help the church determine whether a phenomena, in their worldview, is truly supernatural, or is instead potentially the work of some preternatural being like a demon or an angel. In the eyes of the mystics, God himself is the only true cause of supernatural mystical phenomena, because God himself is the author of the supernatural order. The mystics do recognize that identifying truly supernatural phenomena is tremendously difficult. A number of psychosomatic conditions can obviously present as things that could be considered mystical. The mystics also believe that diabolical or demonic phenomena can, sometimes intentionally, present as supernatural. This can include things like possession, which we discussed earlier. The majority of extraordinary phenomena can be classified as gratiae gratis date, which means grace freely given and can be interpreted as gifts from God. Mystics point to the first letter to the Corinthians when St. Paul states there are diverse gifts of God, but that God himself is one of these gifts. In theory, you could call anything received from God, natural or supernatural, as a gift from God, but the mystics reserve this term for a special type of gift called charisms. These gifts are above the power of man, but also outside of the idea of personal merit. Instead, they are intended for the good of all mankind, rather than one individual. These gifts include things like faith in general, just having belief in God is considered a gift from God but it also includes harder to explain phenomena, the gift of healing, prophecy, the working of miracles, and the act of speaking in tongues. There are a wide variety of phenomena that mystics search for, or perhaps more accurately, are open to and believe to be possible. 
In a single video, I cannot hope to discuss every one of them, but I can discuss the most powerful and remarkable among these phenomena. When union with God is achieved, the intensity can be so great that the body cannot withstand it and thus falls into a state of ecstasy. In a state of ecstasy, the individual does not hear or feel anything. They will not respond to verbal or physical stimuli from other humans. There is no evident sign of respiration or circulation of blood, but they are clearly not dead or sleeping. The expression on the individual's face is joyous, and by all appearances they seem to have been transported to some other world. The ecstatic individual will not return to consciousness unless commanded to do so by a person of authority. There are numerous specifically defined states of ecstasy that a person can enter, but the primary two forms of ecstasy are the delightful and the violent. In the former, the soul is seemingly no longer in its body, but the body expresses feelings of euphoria. This form of ecstasy has been known by mystics to improve an individual's physical health. Then there is the violent ecstasy. In this form, the body suffers so greatly that the person can hardly survive through it. Bones may be dislocated, there may be a significant internal pain or bodily weakness. Muscles may instantly dry up and lose all strength. The body itself may go cold or appear to be dead. After a period of violent ecstasy has passed, the body remains exhausted and painful for several days. How can a person see God? What does it even mean to see God? In many earlier pagan religions, these questions were pretty easy to answer. Gods were often expressed as having human forms or occasionally animal forms. But the Christian mystics propose that God is not some man in the sky, that he is instead everything which exists. The mystic vision of God is contemplation. We touched on contemplation earlier. In this sense, it is again an experiential knowledge of God. It represents a mystical vision of God in a way not so limited by the word vision. Contemplating God has been associated with extraordinary states of consciousness for the mystics. Raptures, out-of-body experiences, or even outside-of-mind experiences. The autobiography by St. Augustine called Confessions is an important part of the mystical canon. In this book, Augustine recounts several visions of God that he claimed to have experienced. The first occurred in Milan when he claimed to experience the light of God. The second he called a rapture that he experienced with his mother. Augustine went on to later categorize the three types of visions that one could have of God. They are corporeal, as in to see a physical body, intellectual, a revealing of divine knowledge, or spiritual, a nebulous third path that engages neither the physical senses or the mind. Visions are often accompanied by, though not always, locutions. By definition, locutions are simply words, and these words may be spoken aloud or otherwise experienced. For the mystics, locutions may exist in three different forms, auricular, imaginative, or intellectual. Auricular locutions are straightforward. They are words that an individual hears. They are perceived by the physical sense of hearing and can be produced by God, angels, or demons. Mystics believe that these often proceed from a vision, a ritual, or a specific religious image like a crucifix or some other instrument. Imaginative locutions are heard only in the imagination. Essentially, a person is hearing voices in their soul rather than their ears. They may proceed from God, the devil, or natural causes. The best way to discern who is producing these locutions is the effect they are having on the soul of the individual. The voice of God will cause humility, fervor, obedience, or even self-immolation. Conversely, locutions heard from the devil cause feelings of violence or insubordination. Intellectual locutions are similar to imaginative, but are heard in the intellect rather than the soul. It is essentially the thoughts of another person appearing in an individual's mind. Intellectual locutions can be further subdivided into categories, as noted by St. John of the Cross, but the differences are formal and relatively minute. There are also revelations. In this context, a revelation is defined as the manifestation of some hidden truth or secret, specifically for the good of the church or a given individual. The church says that revelations can either be public or private, depending on whether the secret is meant for the good of all Christians or, again, just one individual. To the mystics, revelations can be seen vaguely similar to prophecy. 
Both of these indicate some profound secret being revealed through God. Within mystic thinking, there have always been people gifted with prophecy, as stated by its occurrences in the scripture. So to question the possibility of prophecy and revelation is to question the power of God and the holiness of the church itself. Such is the case for many of these phenomena, in fact. The stigmata is perhaps the most famous of all mystical phenomena. It is defined as the spontaneous appearing of the wounds of Christ on an individual. Wounds appear on the hands, feet, and sides. There may also be wounds on the head from a crown of thorns. Stigmata can also cause wounds covering the entire surface of the body, as in the flagellation of Christ. The wounds of the stigmata may be permanent, periodic, transitory, or successive. That is to say, they can appear and disappear over time. Typically, the mystics believe the stigmata is preceded by a period of intense physical and moral suffering. Without these sufferings, the stigmata is only cosmetic. This is because the stigmata represents the union with Christ and a direct participation in his sufferings. Most stigmatics are people who long to be unified with Christ. They typically live an ascetic lifestyle and often practice extreme corporeal penances like fasting or self-flagellation in an effort to foster intense introspection. The mystics do not accept any such wounds as the stigmata, however. Throughout history, they have generally demanded more proof than just the wounds themselves. To help discern between the true stigmata and either fraud or a psychosomatic version of it, mystics have basically a set of criteria. True stigmatas must see all of the following. They are located in the places of the five wounds suffered by Christ. They must bleed on the days or at times when Christ is commemorated, and the flow of this blood must be so great that it cannot be explained naturally. A true stigmata cannot be healed by medication, nor can it produce infections, because the blood from stigmata is always pure and clean. Stigmatas may only occur in people who practice Christian virtue to a heroic degree, and when the wounds appear, they do so suddenly, rather than growing more intense over time. Besides being self-inflicted or psychosomatic, the mystics believe that demons could themselves inflict false stigmata. After all, there's nothing inherently supernatural about a series of wounds. The devil could produce the stigmata in one's imagination, wherein they see and feel the wounds, but those wounds do not actually exist. The devil could also influence an individual to give themselves the wounds of stigmata. Mystics have also reported something called the exchange of hearts. In this phenomena, a person's heart is extracted and replaced with that of another, presumably the heart of Christ himself. The exchange of hearts is marked by a wound or scar over the chest. As violent and bizarre as this sounds, it is one of the more common mystical phenomena and has been alleged in the lives of many notable saints. These people are so venerated that mystics see the phenomenon as undoubtedly real and true. Pope Benedict XIV once stated that the exchange of hearts is in fact spiritual and mystical, defying any true physical explanation. Like in many of these phenomena, the devil could very well simulate the exchange of hearts. This could occur through hallucination, self-infliction, or other trickeries. Within the canon of mystical phenomena, there is also levitation. As the name would suggest, levitation refers to the suspension of a material in the air without any physical support. There are numerous examples of this phenomena in the lives of the saints. Levitation is said to occur during ecstasy. There are, according to the mystics, three types of levitation. Ascensional ecstasy, which is slight levitation, ecstatic flight, where there is great levitation, and ecstatic march, which sees rapid movement or flight above earth. Pope Benedict XIV issued some statements about levitation which have been essentially canonized by the mystics. He said that levitation cannot be explained by natural causes, but that it also does not surpass the powers of angels or demons. There are a number of other phenomena, but even the mystics themselves admit these to be rare and poorly understood. They include the crying of blood, teleportation, bodies not decomposing or burning, prolonged absence of sleep, and absolute unending fasting. Within the writings of theologians, all of these phenomena have been recorded. Of course, it is up to the individual to decide if one believes these writings or not, but they are considered real by the mystics. I personally struggle to believe in any of these things as real as the mystics would say they are, 
but I do believe that the mystical perspective has immense value whether you're Christian or not. As things stand within the conversation of God, I do find the mystical to be refreshing. The modern versions of Christianity are so often tainted by superficial and worldly pursuits, corrupted by greedy or otherwise spiritually bankrupt individuals. Christian mysticism forces the believer to cast all of that aside. It encourages independent thought and analysis. The mystics do not dictate morality or dogma. Instead, their side of the faith thrives in introspection and a sincere connection with the Christian God. Certainly, that is a more godly version of the faith than so much of what we see today. On the other hand, the mystical idea of the Bible being open to interpretation could cause great suffering. Vague interpretations of religious texts are just as likely to be dangerous as they are to be wise and insightful. Examples of this exist in the past, the present, and will certainly exist in the future. It seems to me that this is the destiny of religion, to be at once made sublime and to also be grotesquely twisted by individuals. I don't know if God exists or not, but with this essay my only conclusion is that the concept of God can be beautiful or horrendous, and most likely it is always both. <laughs>